So it's a communications transformation. Nokia says that by 2012, 25% of all media will be made by us. I was listening to a guy called Michael Vesh, um, who's a brilliant professor of uh, social anthropology at the Kansas University in, in the States. And he says that YouTube uploads 20 hours of audiovisual content of every minute of every day of every year. That's a million videos a day. That's an extraordinary amount of information. And uh, thinking about the gentleman, sorry, I can't remember your name, who talked about Peru and actually how you know, you're using, um, so, uh, you're, you're talking about um, you know, YouTube and things. Um, I think it's extremely important to understand that communications transformation is deeply profound. Sorry, I've, I've made you laugh uh, for the wrong reasons. Um, but where does technology come from? Technology does not come out of nowhere. It is a human invention in the first place, and it succeeds or not to the extent that it meets fundamental human needs. Again, Perez talks about the fact in her book that, yes, there are entrepreneurs and there are inventors. Edison, for example, um, Gutenberg is another one. Um, but we look upon those inventions as a society at a certain point of its installation into society. And we decide what are we going to do with that technology to really enable us. So for me, it is no mistake that what we call 2.0 is actually built around fundamental human needs for collaboration because we are a highly social and collaborative species. And it was Carl Jung that said, I need we to truly be I. And as I said, I think that the amazing thing is, is that where we've got to, unfortunately, in our postmodern world is that we have been thin sliced as human beings into very small units of production and consumption. My friend who works at Addenbrooke's Hospital as a clinical psychologist says that, you know, she gets many, many people now that come into her clinics because actually they aren't able to construct their identities in the way that we used to be able to. And so they go on a quest for identity and they struggle in this postmodern world um, to actually find all of the things that make them uh, fundamental kind of human beings. Now, I'll just give an example of that. I live in an old agricultural village called Over, um, just outside of Cambridge. 250 years ago, I would have been born in the village. I would have worked in the village. I would have met my wife in the village. I would have gone to church in the village. I would have traded in the village because it was a market town. And I would have died in the village. My entire identity and life would have been defined by those external forces that surrounded me. And in a postmodern world, that hasn't happened. But interestingly enough, this not is something as recent as the last 10 years. Even in 19, 20, 1926, people were writing about how the Industrial Revolution, the mass consumer society, was already having fundamental effects on people's sense of themselves and their own identity. It was John Stuart Mill writing in Liberty in 1859 that said, human nature is not a model that should be built like a machine and set to do the work exactly prescribed to it but more should be seen like a tree that should be allowed to grow on all size, depending on the thing that makes it uh, a living thing, the inward forces that make it a living thing. And in medieval times, we used to have about 115 festivals a year, high levels of participation, and we used to make ourselves recognised within that group by the wittiness of our jokes, by the colourfulness of our dress, by our ability of athletes or as performers and dancers. And the point I'm trying to make here is, is that, you know, we don't want to be defined as units of production and units of consumption. We don't want to be defined as people that are only good consumers, actually, or good people, or good citizens, when we're out there with our credit cards. And I think we are at a point of deep spiritual crises, because we are living in this country anyway, in a very deeply secular society where we've lost the moral anchors in many ways also about what makes us as people. And so I think that there is this sort of real power to want to sort of get back to what we are as human beings. It was George Soros that actually said that he worried deeply, was deeply concerned that we were creating a closed society and one in which there was only one thing that was important, the display of and creation of material wealth which represented what we were as successful human beings. He argued, in fact, that what we should have is an open society, 
a society um, which allows us then to create value and see value as represented in all sorts of different ways. And we need a kind of different type of language to think about what that open society means. But I think we're on the way, in fact, to the open society. I think that we realise the patient of the human species is actually quite sick in certain parts of the world. I mean, I'm looking at those young boys in the river earlier and looking how happy they were, truly were. And I thought about the inner cities where you see people which are actually very unhappy or the way that people's lives. And that's not what we want to be as people. Anyway, the open society, therefore, should not just satisfy us. It should inspire us all. And I would say that, actually, I'm very uh, humbled uh, to be uh, talking here today and to listen to all the people, because in a sense, the types of ideas, the range of ideas that we've been sharing over the last few days, for me, is representative of a more open way of sharing knowledge and information and thinking about how that reflects on us as people. So here are some observations. People embrace what they create. Um, whether it's through co-creation, collaboration, participation, it's through these things that we create real social cohesion. Whether that's playing in a band, playing sport, whether that's working as a Linux uh, coder, um, whether that's uh, you know, us in this room that we will all leave actually um, you know, over the next few days feeling that we've met new friends, that we've embraced things, that we've maybe created something and thought about other types of possibilities. But this is what we're trying to do with the media. And actually, the way that we, uh, for example, make context and meaning in our lives is how we tell stories. And I think it's fundamentally wrong that media actually says to us, or professional people, that actually we are the professionals that create culture, and you are the people that must consume it. Because that is, again, not the way that we construct ourselves as people. And so there's a massive battle going on in terms of actually how we're going to create organisations and create value in the future, I think based on that fundamental human issue. And it's something that the industrial society and mass media society doesn't like because it means it's got to share. It's got to share value. It's got to share revenue. And it doesn't like that. Richard Sennett, who's someone I've talked about a little bit over the last few days, wrote a fantastic book called The Craftsman. Um, and in it, he described actually how um, once upon a time, you know, all of us in this room, perhaps, or some of us in this room would be in a community and we'd all have slightly different craft skills, whether that was being a blacksmith, whether that was being a cobbler, whether that was being a baker or whatever. You had a skill, but the reality is, is your skill you gave to the benefit of the community. And it was through the sharing of our collective individual skills that we were actually able to survive and thrive and be better and stronger communities. Whereas he talks about a man that he goes as a baker and he presses a button and that apparently starts the baking process. And he says, I don't know what I am. 